God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them nor serve them. For I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me, and shewing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord thy God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless that taketh his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days shalt thou labor and do all thy work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. In it thou shalt not do any work, thou, nor thy son, nor thy daughter, thy manservant, nor thy maidservant, nor thy cattle, nor thy stranger that is within thy gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that in them is, and rested the seventh day. Wherefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, nor his manservant, nor his maidservant, nor his ox, nor his ass, nor anything that is thy neighbor's. This is the whole duty of man. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. There is nothing God requires of any man or woman that falls outside of the Ten Commandments of God. They encompass the whole duty of man. They also encompass the whole duty of angels, the whole duty of the inhabitants on unfallen worlds. Happy Sabbath, everyone. God is good, all and all the time. I'm about to ask you a question. Answer me by raising your right hand. You must raise it truthfully. How many of you love God? Raise any hand. All right. God is pleased. We love him. Why? because he first loved us. In some homes, one spouse waits for the other to love first or to be nice first. That's not heaven's strategy. God loves first. And his love is so intense. If it is even barely appreciated, it brings from us a response of love to him. I'm very honored by God to be with you today, and I will do all in my limited power to represent him aright by delivering to you, thus saith the Lord. It will not always please you, but truth is not always pleasing because it cuts across error. And we're born with a carnal nature which naturally prefers error. And even for members of the church, truth can be distasteful. So let me warn you with brotherly love. Some things I say may displease you. But as long as they please God, my conscience is clear. Can you say amen? amen. Who is visiting with us? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. May I see your hand? 
You are not a self... Did you raise your hand? What's your name? Paul. Paul. That's a powerful Bible name. Paul, we're delighted to have you. Thank you so much. Anyone else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. You have honored us with your presence. Would you raise your hand? What's your name? Dante. Dante, Dante thank you very much for coming to fellowship with us. We're delighted to have you. We have Paul and we have Dante. Is there anyone else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. And my little brother raised his hand. What's his name? Aubrey is a good name. We have Paul, we have Dante, we have Aubrey. Anybody else? You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. What's your name? Say it again. Spell that for me. Say it again. E-D-R. Idre. Deidre. Oh, Deidre. Deidre. Deidre, I have sinned. Forgive me. Deidre. We're happy to have you, Deidre. God bless you. Aubrey, Dante, Paul, and Deidre. Anybody else who have finally made up his or her mind that you're a guest? Yes. What's your name? Hmm? Fee. Fidelina. How are you, Fidelina? Nice to have you. God bless you. Anybody else? Any backslidden Adventists? <laughs> we welcome you as well. Let the church say amen for all our guests. Amen. That was weak. Say it again. Amen. One more time. Amen. God is good. All the time. And all the time. God is good. Amen. I bring you greetings from the Ypsilanti SDA Church and the Lake Region Conference, our president, Garth Gabriel. And we love God on that side of the border, and we believe you love him on this side. The only border God recognizes is the border between right and wrong, between evil and righteousness, between truth and error. That's why he says, what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? What communion hath light with darkness? The answer is none. Our subjects of this evening, or for this morning, from darkness to light. What did I say? From darkness to light. If you're not using one of these, make sure it is turned off until it is dead. If you're using it, turn down the volume, please. I believe that's a reasonable request. Do you agree? Amen. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me and say, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. I want God to fill my mouth, my mind with his word. His word will bless you. My opinions won't. So I will severely restrict my opinions and unleash upon you thus saith the Lord. Jesus said of God's words, the words that I speak unto you, finish it. They are spirit and they are light. And that's what you need. Favor number three, think as you listen. Isaiah 118, come now, let us do what? Reason together, saith the Lord. That's one of the things I like about God. He is a reasonable God. And God will sit down with you. And ask you, my son, why have you not come back to church? Talk to me. My daughter, why are you involved with someone outside of the church? Talk to me. My son, why are you working on the Sabbath when I own the entire universe? And the silver and the gold are mine? Talk to me, says God. Come now. Let us reason together. My son, why are you rebelling against your parents who are paying you school fees, feeding you, paying for your clothes? Why are you following your friends instead of your parents? Talk to me. Let's pray. Father in heaven, 
Without you, we can do nothing except sin. But Father, we've assembled in your presence there, God, to listen to the word that changes lives, the word that purifies, the word that enlightens, and the word, if received, that saves. I ask in the name of Jesus Christ who shed his blood, if I have sinned against you today, God, forgive me. You're not a God who holds grudges. You forgive and you forget. Oh, that we could be that way, Father. Now, dear God, grant me a generous measure of your spirit. He is the spirit of truth. Let him speak through me, dear God. Father, I have a carnal nature which loves attention. I ask you now to take that nature by the throat and choke it into submission. That your glory becomes my only business. Surround this place with angels that excel in strength. That we may worship without satanic interference. Father, tell me what to say, when to say it, how to say it. Let me speak boldly, dear God, but with compassion, for I too am a sinner. Wherever your people are worshiping you, Father, bless them with truth, I pray. Bless the country of Canada. Bless the United States. And if this service is online, bless every country represented by those watching. Now, Father, glorify your name. And give us the blessings we need so urgently. In Jesus' name we pray. Let God's people say amen, amen and amen. Go with me to Matthew 28. We'll read from verse 18. What's our subject? From darkness to light. It is now two minutes after 12. I'll release you before one. Matthew 28. Reading from verse 18, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me, where? In heaven and in earth. Stop. How much power? All, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth, meaning everywhere. There is no place where Jesus Christ does not have power. He has power over the forces of darkness. He has power over the angels. He has power over the unfallen worlds. There is no place where Christ does not have power. And if you and I are followers of Christ, that should fill our hearts with confidence and assurance that we serve a God who has power everywhere. And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go ye therefore, and do what? Teach all nations. Stop. Give me another word for all nations. The world. We are commanded by Christ. Go ye therefore, and teach all nations. Give me another word for teach. You're too slow for teach. Instruct. Give me another word. Based on our subject for this morning, give me another word. Enlighten. Evangelize is good, but I want it enlighten. Go ye therefore and teach. Don't let them teach you. As happens too often in this modern world. If you were to do a survey, however unscientific, you would be alarmed by the results, which would be, to a large degree, the world teaches the church. It teaches us how to dress. It teaches us how to spend our money. It teaches us how to conduct romantic relationships. It teaches us how to work. It teaches us how to play. It teaches us how to worship. which is in direct contradistinction to what Jesus said, you go and teach them. Because in the context of the gospel, the world has nothing to teach the church. Go therefore and teach all nations, 
baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you all the way, even unto the end of the world. When Jesus says, I am with you, combine that with his earlier words, all power is given unto me. Therefore, when Christ is with you, what is with you? All power. Not just power. All power. And that is not symbolic language. All power. We have been commissioned by God to do something for the world that the world cannot do for itself. A person in darkness spiritually cannot bring himself or herself out of darkness. That person must be led out of darkness. In Isaiah 14 verse 17, the Bible tells us of Satan. He opened not the house of his prisoners. What does that mean? When the devil has you, he does not let you go. Someone has to come for you. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 12, 28, 29, or else, how can one enter into a strong man's house and spoil his goods, except he first bind the strong man, and then he will spoil his house. To spoil is to take away. And his goods are the prisoners, people. When the devil has you, he does not let you go. Someone has to come and deliver you. Amen. The devil's prison house is darkness. Go to Isaiah 42. Let's read 6 and 7. Our subject, from darkness to light. Has anyone said yet, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth? Anybody has said that prayer yet? Oh, you have. I'm grateful to you. God bless you. When I say God bless you, it's a prayer I'm offering with my eyes open, made up of three words. God bless you for praying for me. The rest of you who have not yet prayed, you have about 40 minutes left <laughs> to do that. What book did I say? Isaiah, what chapter? 42, what verses? 6 and 7. Read with me if you have my version, although that request is pointless. I, the Lord, hath called thee in righteousness and will hold thy hand and will keep thee and give thee for a covenant of the people for a light of the Gentiles. Now, the next verse carefully. To do what? To open the blind eyes. Now, we are encountering what is called Hebrew parallelism. It's a poetic feature of the Old Testament, and the, the Bible really is very common. It's a style that the Hebrews use in their writing and speech. Look at verse 7 carefully. To open the blind eyes. Read the next statement. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. Those two statements are saying the same thing. Someone spiritually blind is in prison. And them that sit in darkness out of the prison house there are four statements they're all saying the same thing read verse 7 again I'm going to get laryngitis asking you to read with me first statement of verse 7 says what to do what to open the blind eyes now look at the third statement what does that say and them that sit in darkness so the blind eyes and them that sit in darkness are the same thing now look at the second statement. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. Look at the fourth statement. Read the fourth statement. Read the fourth statement of verse 7. Let's read the whole thing. <laughs> to open the blind eyes. To bring out the prisoners from the prison. And them that sit in darkness, final statement are out of the prison house. The mission of Christ was to bring prisoners out of prison. But the prison is what? Blindness. And blindness is what? 
And darkness is what? The absence of? And light is? Truth. When Jesus Christ said, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, take them the light of truth. Amen. There are people stumbling in darkness, not knowing that eternal issues are at stake. Let's see an example of someone brought from darkness to light. But let me pray again. Father in heaven, as I continue speaking for you, speak through me. Hide me. Take center stage. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Go to the book of Acts, chapter 9. We'll read from verse 1. Our subject, from darkness to light. It is 11 minutes after 12. We are in good time. What book did I say? Acts chapter 9. Thank you, sister. Reading from what verse? Verse 1. I get more answers from this side. I'm trying to figure out what's wrong with you. <laughs> Acts chapter 9, reading from verse 1. Are you ready? And Saul yet breathing out what? Threatenings and slaughter against the disciples of the Lord went unto the high priest and desired him letters to Damascus, to the synagogues, that if he found any of this way, whether they were men or women, he might bring them bound unto Jerusalem. Pause. Let me explain. Paul, before he was converted, arranged to have Christians killed. Are you with me? He did not kill them physically, but in the eyes of God, he was just as guilty. He arranged for followers of Christ to be killed. Who would have guessed that man would become the most powerful preacher only after Christ? Are you with me? Never give up on people who seem to be hopeless because you don't know what God can do. And that hopeless person may be a family member. It may be one of your children. Do not give up on someone who seems to be hopeless in your limited eyes. And forget that with God, all things, come on, are possible. Verse 3, And as he journeyed, he came near Damascus, and suddenly there shined round about him a light from heaven, and he fell to the earth and heard a voice saying unto him, What? Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Remember we read in Matthew 20, 28, verse 20, Lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. This verse now, why persecutest thou me, helps us to understand the degree to which Christ is with us. He is with us to such a degree. He has a oneness with us that results in the reality that anything done to us, finish my words, is done to him. So that when anyone touches us, they touch the apple, come on, of his eye. And so Jesus said, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And he said, Who art thou, Lord? And the Lord said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Jesus said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Christ is the head of the body. What is the body? The church. We are members of his body, of his flesh, of his bones. When God brought Eve to Adam, Adam now said, this is now, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. Make a spiritual application. The, the woman called Eve, the church, is indeed born of Christ's bone and flesh of his flesh. Amen. I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Verse 6. And he said what? Lord, and he trembling and astonished said, Lord, what will thou have me to do? There are people who will tell you a relationship with Christ is only based on what you believe. Just believe. And you have nothing else to do. Paul didn't say, what will thou have me to believe? 
even though belief has its place. He said, what will thou have me come on to do? When the rich young ruler came to Christ, he said, my good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Not what shall I do to give myself eternal life. That is salvation by works. What shall I do to inherit, to receive from someone else? The Philippi jailer said to Paul and Silas, what shall I do to be saved? No one is saved in idleness. And so Paul said, Lord, what wilt thou have me to do? And the Lord said unto him, read verse 6 with me, arise and go into the city. Finish the verse. And it shall be told thee what thou must do. Now think with me. That's favor number three. Christ could have told him exactly what he needed to do. Are you with me? What was the first question Paul or Saul asked Christ? What, does he, what did he ask him? Who art thou, Lord? Did Jesus answer specifically? Did Jesus answer specifically? Yes. I tend to be a little hard on people. I have to watch myself. But I'm only hard when I see a congregation that looks very, very intelligent. Then I become very hard on them when they're too slow. Are you following me? We're not turtles. We have the mind of God. Somebody say amen. Now, the question Saul asked was, who art thou? Did Christ answer him specifically? Yes. What did he say? I am Jesus. A precise response to precise question. Now, Saul said, what will thou have me to do? Listen to the words of Christ. And the Lord said unto him, Arise, go into the city, and it shall be told thee. Did Jesus answer him specifically on question two? No. Jesus said there are people who will tell you what you need to do. And when they speak, it will be, God bless you in every possible way. It'll be me speaking. Oh, you're not impressed. Uh, it's a rough job speaking to a handsome mausoleum. Hey. Jesus said there are people in Damascus who have the authority to speak for me. Let me broaden that. Christ is no longer on the earth. He has a people on this earth who must speak for him. But to speak for Christ, you must say what Christ says. Let the passage explain what I mean. Verse 7, And the men which journeyed with him stood speechless, hearing a voice, but seeing no man. And Paul arose from the earth, and when his eyes were opened, he saw what? No man. But they did what? They had him by the hand and brought him into Damascus. Now, verse 10. And there was at Damascus, a disciple at Damascus named Ananias. And to him said the Lord in a vision, Ananias, and he said, Behold, I am here, Lord. Now Jesus leaves Saul. Are you with me? The final words, according to that passage, was, you go into the city and it shall be told thee, now Jesus goes to Ananias to tell Ananias how to deal with Saul. God does not work around his church. He does not bypass his church. His church is his legitimate legal instrument on the earth. Amen. And so he went to the church. And it wasn't the Jewish church. You see, the Jewish church was the church Saul represented when he was killing people. Which means not all churches belong to Christ. The word church 
is not necessarily a safe word. The fact that you do it in church doesn't make it acceptable to God. If it is not done according to thus saith the Lord. The Bible calls the Israelites the church in the wilderness. When Aaron led the Israelites in the worship of the golden calf, they did it in church. And God threatened to destroy the entire nation. When the sons of Levi, of Aaron, brought strange fire to church, God killed them. When Abel and Cain came to worship, they came to church. God rejected Cain and accepted Abel. The word church is not necessarily safe. It has to be based on truth. Jesus took Saul from one church and placed him in another. All those who believe in evangelism say amen. Because that's what you're seeking to do. I told you I'll say some things that you might find a little unpleasant. But in John 6... Verse 66, the Bible says, from that time, many of his disciples went back and walked no more with him. Why? Because he said something they did not like. And they said, this is a hard saying. Who can take this? And Jesus said, does this offend you? The obvious answer was yes. And they left. And so Christ went to Ananias. And he said, I am here, Lord. And the Lord said unto him, arise and go into the street which is called straight and inquire in the house of Judas for one Saul of Tarsus for behold he prayeth and hath seen in vision a man named Ananias coming in and putting his hand on him we finish verse 12 that he might receive what sight I'm making a spiritual application go to first Timothy chapter 1 let's read verses 12 and 13 to try to explain what I mean by making a spiritual application. What's our subject? You're still slow. From darkness to light. What book did I say? What chapter? What verses? And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord who hath enabled me because he counted me what? Faithful putting me into the? Now read verse 13 carefully. Which before was a? Blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, carefully now, but I obtain what? Mercy. Why? Because I did it ignorantly. Come on in. Give me another word for unbelief. Based on our subject. Darkness. I did it ignorantly, says Paul, in unbelief. And God sent Paul to Ananias that he may see the light then Ananias answered and said verse 13 Acts 9 Lord I have heard by many of this man how much evil he hath done to thy sins at Jerusalem and now he here he hath authority from the chief priests to bind all that call on thy name Ananias is hesitant. Some of us are hesitant to go to certain parts of Hamilton to give out tracts. I have heard how dangerous it is, Lord, to go to the western part of Meva, not realizing the western part of any city needs the gospel. Doctors without borders don't say that. They just go where the bullets are flying and the bombs are exploding to do a work that cannot compare with the work of the gospel. Amen. But we will not go where there's a risk of breaking a fingernail. Lord, I have heard of this man, by many of this man, how much evil he hath done to thy sins in Jerusalem. And here he hath authority from the chief priest to bind all that call on thy name. But the Lord said unto him, go thy way. For he's a chosen vessel unto me. He was chosen before he was converted. 
It's hard to impress you. <laughs> Nobody said amen. amen. You see, what applies to Saul applies to you. Amen. God chose you before you heard the truth. That's part of the gospel. Because it is not in the carnal nature to choose God. I want this side to stay quiet for five minutes. <laughs> Don't say anything. Thank you for your support. Don't say anything. Listen to what the Bible says. As it is written, there's none righteous, no, not one. There's none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, not Nicodemus, Zac Zacchaeus. He looks 19 verse 10. The son of man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. Christ was seeking you before you were seeking him. I told you keep quiet. God bless you. Listen to me, Christ sought us before we sought him. Why? Because it is impossible to see Christ. And I'll get back to Saul and Ananias. Let me pray again. Fathers, I continue. Simplify my language, God. And let your will be done. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Listen carefully. People seek church. Not God. To seek God is to seek holiness, is to seek integrity, is to seek sinlessness. Mm. But you can seek church and not seek godliness. You can seek church and not seek sinlessness. When Jesus said, come unto me. He meant that literally. He did not say come to a church. That's not step one. Step one is come to me. Now I have a church. I'll put you in it. But come to me. Because he did say that upon this rock I will build my church. By the way, not I will build my churches. Hey. Let me assume that you're thinking that's why you're quiet. Is that the reason? All right. You're taking it in. Okay. Oh. Upon this rock, I will build my church. Singular. Not my churches. Let me get back. People are incapable of seeking God. They seek church. Because church represents something that's natural to us, which is social settings you see hanging out together i look like him he looks like me we eat the same thing we go to the same places so i come to church i have fellowship society i make friends and i have a sort of support base i can get that without god but to give up my life of sin to give up my pet iniquities to strive after holiness to change how i eat and how I drink, and how I speak, and what I watch, and how I read. I don't need a church for that. I need God. Amen. At the risk of being repetitious and irritating, people do not seek God. They seek what church does for them. That's clearly represented in John 6 when Jesus fed the 5,000. He took a boat, went to the other side of the lake, and they followed him. And they said, Master or Rabbi, whence camest thou hither? And he said, Verily, verily, I say unto you, ye seek me not because ye saw the miracle, but because ye did eat of the loaves and were filled. If I join the church, I get help with my rent. I get food on the weekends. I, my children can join the Pathfinder Club. Get them out of my hair for a few hours. We have to seek. Come on, tell me. God. And God is not a doctrine. God is a person. He loves. He hates. He gets angry. He has wrath. He has justice. 
He has mercy. He's long-suffering. He has limits to his patience. He desires to save all, but will not hesitate to destroy the, the stubborn and hard-headed. And those who try to show God their arms are long enough to box with him. And so we go back to Saul and Ananias. For he's a chosen vessel unto me to bear my name before the Gentiles and kings and the children of Israel. For I will show him how great things he must suffer for my name's sake. Ananias was empowered and commissioned by God to enlighten Saul. Not just Ananias, but the group of believers. Because verse 19 tells us, uh, when Saul had received meat, he was strengthened. Then was Saul certain days with the disciples, which were at Damascus. He, went, he was sent by God to the church to be taught, to be enlightened, to be baptized. We have a man brought from darkness to light. And Jesus says to us, ye are the light of the world. Let's look at that at 1231. Go to Matthew 5 as quickly as you can. The first person who finds it, say amen. No, you don't have it yet. Oh, you do? Well, you're the pastor, you should be first. Okay, the pastor has it first. Okay, Dr. Anthony, good example for the slow coaches in the pews behind you. Do you have Matthew 5 now? Let's read from verse 1 microscopically, 1 and 2. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain. And when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, taught them, saying, Stop. We have two groups in those two verses. Identify them. The multitude and the disciples. To whom was Jesus speaking? The not the multitude. Now we have to assume the multitudes what? Overheard. But Christ was speaking to the disciples because the Sermon on the Mount is not for unbelievers. You have to be a child of the kingdom, a converted person to accept and whosoever shall smite thee on thy right cheek. <laughs> mm -hmm. You've got to be a converted person. If any man will compel thee to go a mile, go with him twain. That is the lifestyle of a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. Christ was addressing the disciples, not the multitude. Now to the disciples, he said, in the hearing of the multitudes, read verse 14 for me now of Matthew 5. Ye are the light of the world. Now the multitude surely represented the world. And Jesus said to them, you are to be a light to them. Because they have no light. I'm not being narrow-minded. I'm just being biblical. The world has no light in the context of present truth. The three angels' messages, the world has no light. You're not required by God to know astrophysics to get to heaven. So the world can teach us astrophysics and accounting and chemistry and agriculture, fine. In the context of the gospel, the world can teach the church precisely nothing. Let me tell you something else about the world. The world is not simply those who don't go to church. <laughs> the world essentially is that part of the earth that is not among God's people. That's the world. You see, the Bible has never presented three groups on the earth. 
The Bible has always presented two. From Christ and Satan to Cain and Abel. Are you with me? All the way, Ellen White tells us there are only two classes on the earth today. And only two classes will be recognized in the judgment. Those who violate God's law and those who obey it. Christ told us they're sheep. Come on. And goats. He told us there are wheat and tares. When Christ comes back, like a shepherd, he divides the sheep from the goats. The goats go to hell. The sheep go to the kingdom. And the goats will include those who attended church and those who didn't. In John 16, 12, the Bible says of Jesus, I have yet many things to say unto you, but ye cannot bear the... Can you handle what I'm saying? All false churches are part of the world. How many special people did Jesus have or God have, same thing, in the Old Testament? Name them. The Israelite. Did he ever identify a second people? No. Did the Israelites give him a headache, a headache, a headache, a headache? Yes. Were they still his people? Yes. Were they still the descendants of Abraham? Yes. God never swapped them for the Philistines. And when he finally abandoned them as a special nation, he, he, he formed spiritual Jews. So still Jews. God has always had one special people. Never two. And that one special people is described in Revelation 14. But to describe them, let's describe the other group first. Let's go to Revelation 14. We'll read from verse 9 our subject, from darkness to light. It's 23 minutes to 12, to our one. Who else has said, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth? Anybody? Ah, God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. God bless you. Oh, little brother, God bless you. How nice. God bless you. I mean that. Always pray for anyone in this desk. By doing so, you protect your own mind. Because if you say, put your words in that man's mouth or that woman's mouth, then the word spoken will be safe. Do not allow someone to occupy a desk without praying for that person. You can pray two prayers, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. Or if you choose not to, protect my mind from evil. What book did I say? Revelation. What chapter? 14. What verse? 9. Now, surely, as an Adventist church, you should be able to say this passage. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, what? If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of the torment ascendeth up forever and ever. And they have no rest day nor night to worship the beast and his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. Now that's one group. Now listen to the second group. Read verse 12. You read. I'll be quiet. Mm -hmm. All right. I want you to read it again. This time, this side, keep quiet. <laughs> Revelation 14, 12. Well, miracles do happen. <laughs> we have two groups, not three. The group in 9 to 11 are commandment breakers. Contrasted with the group in 12 who are commandment keepers. Now you may say to me, how do you identify the group in 9 to 11 as commandment breakers? Let's think and add verse upon verse, line upon line. What else? Precept upon precept. What else? Here a little. Come on. There a little. That's the way Adventists do it. Let's read from 9 again. Read nice aloud. What does it say? 
And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Stop. Let's look at the wrath of God. Then we can identify why this group must drink this wrath. Go to Ephesians 5. Ephesians 5. Bless you for being quick. You have Ephesians 5? We read from verse 3 to 6. 19 minutes to 1. But fornication and all uncleanness or covetousness, let it not be once named among you as become his saints. Neither filthiness, nor foolish talking, nor jesting which are not convenient, but rather giving of thanks. For this ye know, that no homonger, or unclean person, or covetous man, who is an idolater, hath any inheritance in the kingdom of Christ or of God. Now, verse 6 says what? Be not let no man deceive you with vain words, for because of these things, stop. What are these things? All the sins listed, verses 3 to 5. Are you following me? Give me one word for all these things. Sin. What is sin? The transgression of the law. Now, for because of these things, finish verse 6. Cometh the wrath of God. Uh-huh. Go on. Upon the children. Come on. Ah, now. The wrath of God is poured out upon the children of? That's what we read in Ephesians 5, 6. Now go back to Revelation 14. Read from verse 9. Let's read nice and slow. Not because it's a beautiful passage, but we want to understand it. And the third angel followed him, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beasts in his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his... By the way, the word worship is no different from obey. That's why God said to Saul through Samuel, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices, come on, as in obeying the voice of the Lord. The foundation of worship is a recognition of someone's authority, and that recognition is only demonstrated by obedience. If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark, in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God. Who is the same? Those who worship or obey the beast which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Now we have two terrible things that will happen to the disobedient. Those who remain in darkness will not come to the light. The wrath of God, fire and brimstone. Go to Revelation 15, read verse 1. And I saw, what? Another sign in heaven, great and marvelous. Seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up what? Aha. Uh -huh. So the wrath of God is what? The seven last plagues. They'll be poured out on those who disobey God's law. Those who will be spared are those described in verse 12. Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. Stop. Commandments of God. Because they are commandments of men. Like Sunday worship. Is a commandment of man. The man who introduced Sunday worship as a national event was Constantine. In 321 A.D., Mm -hmm. He passed the law. Work on Saturday, rest on the day of the sun, and soon thereafter, the church picked it up. To such a degree that in the Council of Laodicea, the church passed a law. It's called Canon 29. And it anathematized anyone who kept the Sabbath. What do I mean by anathematize? Condemn them to hell for obeying God. Sunday as the Sabbath 
is a commandment of man. God says, here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God. When the Israelites were assembled around Sinai, God came down with the law. The law did not go up. Are you following me? The law came down and God himself spoke it through his agent, Christ, who was not called Christ then, but the same person. He spoke it audibly. All two million heard it at the same time so there could be no confusion. Then he gave several ceremonial details to Moses, but only to Moses. Then Moses wrote them in a book. The Ten Commandments God wrote on stone. He spoke them. He wrote them. Spoke them publicly. Everyone heard. To change God's law, you have to go to heaven and change it up there. Are you following me? You cannot enact a law on earth and then send it up to God and tell God this is a new law. The Bible says, go to James 4 verse 12 quickly, then I'll think about letting you go. James 4 verse 12, and I want you to meditate carefully and quickly on that verse. You have James 4? I heard someone to my left say amen, a lady. All right, James 4. Read for me. What does that say? There is one lawgiver who is able to or to this. There is one lawgiver. Who is that? God, Christ. Constantine introduced himself as a second lawgiver. But this one lawgiver is able to save or destroy. Constantine can't save you into God's kingdom or send you to hell. There is one lawgiver. It is not the Pope. It is a man who died on Calvary's cross. Can you say amen? And he died because that law was broken. And he has a people on earth. Beautifully described in last day events. Page 43, paragraph 3. God has a church, a people, a distinct people on earth. Second to none. And superior to all in their facilities to teach the truth and to vindicate the law of God. And so Jesus said, go ye therefore and teach all nations. They need what you have, even though they don't know it. Go and teach them. Now this commission does not guarantee 100% results. But Jesus himself tells us in Matthew 24, 14, And this gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in all the world. Why? For a witness so no one can say what? I did not know. Yes, we're delighted when people accept the truth. But even if they don't, shake the dust of your feet because that person cannot say, I did not know. You're the light of the world. So when you say, I will go, you will go and do what? You will go and say what? Are you going with a consciousness that God has a special message for this world. And it's called the three angels' messages. And the only church on the face of the earth that proclaims those messages, even though they're in the Bible, is a Seventh-day Adventist church. Today, I want you to recommit your life, your lives, to the message of God. Recommit your lives to the great gospel commission. But actually, recommit your lives to Christ. Christ was a soul winner. And if we're his brothers and sisters in his humanity and his followers in his divinity, 
He is our God in his divinity. He's our brother in his humanity. We can do no less than to do as Jesus did. When Christ prayed to his Father in John 17, he said in verse 17, Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. Now read verse 18 and apply it to your own life. Do you have verse 18? Well, let me tell you what it says. As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. Whatever God sent Christ to do, Christ is sending us to do. Can you say amen? And Christ came to represent the Father. You and I must represent Christ by what we say and by how we live. As thou hast sent me into the world, as means the same way. What some of us fail to understand, there is a relationship that exists between the Father and the Son. It must be perfectly replicated in the relationship between Christ and the believer. Yes, sir. Amen. Amen. I may have said that clumsily, let me say it again. As much as Christ and the Father are one, the believer and Christ, finish my words, must be one. And so as much as the Father sent the Son, the Son sends you. And that theme is right through the New Testament. This is my commandment, that you love one another how? As I have loved you. I have given you an example that you should do as I have done to you, the foot washing ceremony. How many of you will say, Father, thank you for opening my eyes and reminding me of what perhaps I already knew. Here am I. Use me. Can I see your hand? You mean that? Stand up with me. Eight minutes to one. Listen carefully. By the way, I fail to greet my friends online. Thank you for joining us. And may the Lord bless you wherever you are. And this call is also for you. If there's someone listening to me, you have drifted from your Savior. You need to come back. You've drifted from your Savior. You need to come back. Come, let's pray. I said you have drifted from your Savior. You need to come back. The Pharisees who said, kill him, they were in church. But they had drifted far from their Savior. Come. Come. Someone else, come. I have drifted from my God. And I need to stop. Before I drift so far, I won't come back. Come. I have drifted. I know it. No one else does but God. In an act of honesty, I'm coming to say to my Savior, I no longer want to drift. Let's begin all over again with my hands in your hands. Let's walk. Come. I'm not saying you were committing crimes and killing people and running a whorehouse or a casino, but you have, you have been overwhelmed by the desire to survive on this earth and spiritual things have ceased to be your priority. You have drifted. And the text that Christ spoke applies to you directly. What is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world. Maybe someone is on the verge of losing the soul because you're wrapped up in trying to gain the world. Come. Most people who are lost will be decent people. Someone else. Six minutes to one. I have drifted from my Savior. I'm coming back. There's rejoicing in heaven when people come back. Come. Online, come in your own way. God has missed you. He saw, he saw you in church, but he's missed you. Come. 
I've never seen a joke in the Bible. Salvation is a serious matter. It's life and death. And when Christ steps out of the most holy place and he says he that is unjust, let him be unjust still, the case is closed. As verily as it was closed in the days of Noah, when an angel shut the door of the ark, those on the inside were sealed in their salvation, those on the outside sealed in their destruction. There was no going back for either side. Come, I have drifted. Give you 60 seconds and I pray. While the 60 seconds are ticking away, who has not yet made a decision to be baptized, but you need to make it, you know enough to make a decision to say, I want to be baptized. Can I see your hand? You know enough to say, God bless you. I'm very happy. God bless you. I need to be baptized. You know enough to make that. God bless you. The church and your parents will arrange your time. God bless you. God bless you. I mean it from my heart. God bless you. 30 seconds left, a third call. I really need to be rebaptized. Evangelism, page 375, paragraph 2. When a soul is reconverted, let that soul be rebaptized. Let him renew his covenant with God, and God will renew his covenant with him. Reconversion must take place in the churches. You may need to be rebaptized. God bless you. God bless you. I was in South Africa, no, South Korea, preaching. Made a call for rebaptism. Fifty people came. A retired minister joined me as I spoke to them. And he told us in the middle of his ministry, he decided to be rebaptized because spiritually he had gone nowhere. The conference president wanted to baptize him at night. He said, No, baptize me in front of my church because there are members who need to be rebaptized. They were baptized once, but they were just wet. They need to die and rise. Someone come and get names quickly. Come and, this is a serious decision. Come and get names. Please. For those who make a decision to be baptized and rebaptized, come and get the names before I pray. Let's try to minimize moving because this is serious. The spirit is present. Let's minimize our moving. You should be praying quietly. Come and get the names, please. More than one can get names. It quickens the process. We have my brother, we have my brother, we have my brother right here, and I saw sister's hand somewhere, right here. My little sister wants to be baptized at some point, we have my little brother wants to be baptized. God bless you. Mm -hmm. God is delighted when children give their lives to him. And for the children, your parents in the church will arrange a date. For the adults, that can be done quickly. Somebody else. My little brother in the balcony wants to be baptized at some point. Don't ignore him. Never ignore a child who wants to be baptized. If you do that, the child may never have the urge again. Say yes and let the child know we will arrange a date. Anybody else? Name a number. Yes, thank you, Pastor. Name a number. Somebody else. Baptism, rebaptism. No one knows if he or she will be alive tomorrow. It's two minutes to one. I see your hand. My hands, my little brother. God bless you. God bless you. We get the names and I pray. Thank God you have the strength to stand. All right. Anybody else? Get that name of that number. Anybody else? Okay. Heads bowed. Eyes closed. Dear God, we thank you for the moving of your spirit. We thank you, dear God, for the comforting promise the Lord is not willing that any should perish. We thank you for the high honor, Father, of calling us to be the light of the world. But we can only be the light if we ourselves have light. And someone who's drifted from God is not a light. It may be a hindrance. Father, some have come to say, I am coming back, and you are delighted, dear God. Wrap your long, elastic arms around all of them, Father. Draw them into your bosom, dear God, and remind them, tell them, that you miss the close fellowship you used to have. And give them the strength, dear God, to never drift from you again. And for those who've made decisions to be baptized for the first time, keep them firm in this decision, Father. In the name of Jesus Christ, dear God, touch everyone who listened with your spirit. 
and put within us a desperate desire to get close to our Savior because it is closeness to him that is our only safety in these last days. Now, God, as we prepare to depart, let the words we heard remain in our hearts and our minds, Father, to do its work of transformation. Bless our online audience, dear God, and bring us back later today for the next program that is planned. I pray from my heart in Jesus' name, let God's people say amen, amen and amen. Before you sit, while you're standing, quickly, what will you take from the message? Raise your hand and tell us. What will you take from the message? I don't, I don't know who's talking. Raise a hand. Yes. From darkness to light. Yes, that's God's desire for us. Somebody else. What will you take from the message? Oh, yes. Anybody else? Anybody else? Yes, sister. Be the, light of the world. be the light of the world. Be the light of the world. And you cannot be the light unless your life is consistent with this. Because this is the light, the word of God. Anybody else? Yes. Christ is the head, of the, body. Christ is the, head the body of the church. We are one with him as Eve was one with Adam, born of born, flesh of flesh. Yes. All power, All power is given to Christ. When Christ is with you, there's no reason to panic. Somebody, yes, my brother. Christ has one church. He has one church. He has always had one people. Yes. Never give up on anyone because with God, all things are possible. Anybody else? Yes, my sister. Say it again. A person in darkness. Oh, yes, if you're in darkness, you have to be led out. You cannot decide to leave. The devil, thank you, yes. And that person is Christ through his spirit and through the word. One more. Yes. Teach. Don't let the world teach you. Teach the world, not just by what you say, but by how you live. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Let God's people say Amen and amen.